All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our August chapter of the Symbiota Support Group. We're glad that you all could come. Uh, I'm glad to see such good turnout because we're going to be talking about very exciting things, in my opinion, um, and things that will be coming in the future, or some of you might have already experienced these changes um, if you're in one of our beta testing portals. So thanks for being here. And I'll go ahead and get started with my slides. Oops, wrong share. OK. So first, a couple of announcements. Um, just a, a lot like this month, uh, next month's Symbiota Support Group is going to be the second Monday of the month. And that's because it would otherwise align with uh, or overlap with the Tadwig Spinach 2024 meeting. That is the Biodiversity Data Standards Group and the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections. They're having a joint meeting in Okinawa, Japan. And um, I will be there as well as probably many of our users. So we're just going to move that one week uh, later. So September 9th, meet a, uh, join us for that. And Lindsay, do you remember what the topic is? Yes, I think it's actually sort of a continuation of what we're talking about this week. It might, it may be that we'll be talking about the batch upload tool in a little more depth. Oh, yes, good point. We, I believe we'll be talking about batch leading uh, sorry, batch loading associations. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those associations are later on in this talk. Um, also, if you're affiliated with a consortium of California herbaria, or you know of any California herbaria, we are beginning the uh, CCH2 portal advancement campaign tomorrow. So that's tomorrow at 2 p.m. Pacific. And we're gonna be uh, joining a bunch of folks to improve their data and their mobilization in the CCH2 portal. So if you know of any California herbarium folks, please do let them know. Um, even if they're not in the portal yet, they can still participate and learn more about what uh, the portal is used for. OK, let's dive into our topic for the day, and that is upcoming changes in Symbiota 3.1. So. First, I'm going to talk about what a code release is. Um, 3.1 is what we're calling a code release. And then we're going to be talking about what is in this particular code release, and then how you can interact with that code release and what it kind of means for you, how to get more information, and then how to provide feedback. Because no code is perfect, and there will always be some things that need to be adjusted. And we'd love to hear your guys' feedback about how to make that happen. OK, first of all, what is a code release? So you might remember that Symbiota itself is just a code. It's an open source code, and it's managed in a code base in GitHub. So all the code goes in GitHub. People will take um, what we call the checkout um, branches, or they check out forks of, that brand, of the code base, and then they make edits. And then they can move that uh, data or that code back into the central code base. So what this means is that a lot of people can be working on it at one time and can be improving at one time. So we have multiple developers who are working on different parts of the code at one time. And then this code base is deployed to multiple different portals. So we basically have a copy that belongs to CCH2, a copy that belongs to Cynet, a copy that belongs to the Bryophyte and the Lichen portals, and a bunch of other Symbiota portals. But that copy is nicely synced with the central code base. So when there is a big update or upgrade to the Symbiota main code, because these are linked together, we can push that updated code to another portal. So with a code release, we are saying we have a new and improved version of this code, and now we can start rolling it out to all these other portals. Once we have that new and improved version, it doesn't mean that instantly all of the portals have that version. 
It just means that that's available and that is the most, um, the currently supported version of the code. And slowly, we will be rolling that out to the portals, at least the ones that the Symbiota Support Hub manages. So just because we have a brand new version of the code and we're saying it's officially released, it doesn't mean that you're gonna instantly see it in your portal, but um, we'll be keeping you apprised as to when the portal that you're working in is going to um, see that new version of the code because then you'll probably interact with it probably mostly the same, but just so that you're kind of keyed into like, oh, that looks weird, or maybe that doesn't work quite right, then you know, oh, okay, this was updated, so it might just be a bug in the new code version. <clears throat> so um, Symbiota developers are constantly fixing bugs as we find them, but new tools require testing before we can add them to all the portals. Um, and so then that's why we um, have been slowly rolling this out. It's not just like, hey, we have this new thing and it's gonna go out to everyone immediately. And the code release is updating the portal code to include all of the new tools eventually. All right, just gonna pause there and ask if anyone has any questions. So the code release is gonna be like, we have a new version in GitHub. And if you manage your own Symbiota portal, then you have access to that. You could bring that new code in. Um, but then the Symbiota Support Hub hosted portals are going to be eventually updated as we are able to get to them. Questions, thoughts? All right, then I'll just keep on moving. OK, so now the exciting part. This is when we talk about what is in this Symbiota 3.1 code release. And you might be asking, when did 3.0 come out? I don't remember 3.0. Um, it was, even though it was a pretty big step, it wasn't um, super obvious to portal users. Like we changed some stuff around in our tables. Um, and so that was the 3.0 release. It came out, it was official. It wasn't super noticed by the community. Um, and I think almost all the portals we work in are 3.0. And then 3.1 is a lot of tools that are accessing those new tables or new structures. So that's why 3.1 might be kind of the first you've heard of it. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the new features in Symbiota 3.1, and I'm particularly gonna point out the funding sources of those tools, because even though the Symbiota support Hub is here and we're supporting you and we're fixing bugs and such. New development actually is not funded by the Symbiota Support Hub at all. Like we have no money to do that. So anything that you see that's like a big improvement was funded by some other project. And so we just wanna give a huge shout out and thanks to these uh, projects that are able to fund the development of something in the central code. And because it's funded in the central code, it can then benefit everyone in the network. So that's super cool. So first, you, one thing you'll probably notice is that in Symbiota 3.1, we have a more updated and unified um, system of icons and fonts. You're probably going to see fewer differences in fonts between pages or between headers and such. Um, and then we've updated all the icons to be a little bit more streamlined. If you dislike the green pluses as much as I have disliked them, then you'll be happy to see the changes there. Um, and then also thanks to National Ecological Observatory Network funding, we do have a modernized search page. And so I'm gonna demonstrate both, both, both of these things. So the CCH2 portal was one of our beta testing portals and um, it has, 3.1 live in it, um, pretty much the newest version. The Lichen portal has also been one of our beta testing communities. So if you have um, interacted with that portal recently, you've also been interacting with 3.1. So here I'll go into search collection so I can show you our new and improved search form. You can still get to the previous search form there's a little pop-up that will show up down here in the bottom left. And that's how you would get to this previous search form that has all the 
um, collections listed in it. But many people will probably want to just do the new streamlined single search form. This has all of the same um, fields that you could previously search. They're just in these little um, accordions. And if you're like, I don't even know what I'm looking for, you can click expand all selections or sections, and then you'll be able to see the entire form. One thing that's really nice is that the collections is no longer a separate page. You no longer have to select all the collections you want to search and then move to the next page in the search. That's all included in this one page. So if I go back to kind of the <clears throat> default, you'll see that taxonomy in, in this portal, at least, is the default open. And then if you wanted to select specific collections, you can go down to collections. And just as previously, you can click on just a few collections and search. You'll also notice that your criteria are going to show up on the right here, which can just be a little helpful double check. Then you can decide whether you want to see the results in a list or a table. You can do your search. And it looks pretty much the same as how it has previously looked. One improvement that seems kind of minor is that you can actually click the back button now and it doesn't get to that scary white screen that says, oh no, you have to reload your page. Um, and it does save all of your search criteria, which does mean that if you wanna change your search, you gotta make sure to click the reset button. But you can do your search. You can add uh, bounding boxes. If you go to sample properties, you can say, I only want ones with images or with coordinates, et cetera. Um, and searching by traits is also still possible if there are traits in your portal. So I can again do my search. And everything looks pretty much the similar. You can see um, some new icons here, not super different. They're very similar to what you would have seen. You would see on like a, um, a Samsung or a or anything that uses Google. All right, so that's pretty much the uh, modern search page. Any questions about that? Otherwise, I'll just keep on trucking, and you can definitely ask questions at the end too. Okay, so thanks to the Eastern Seaboard um, Digitization Thematic Collections Network, or ESB TCN, um, which was a TCN funded by the National Science Foundation to digitize mollusk data, we have been able to incorporate some additional um, Darwin Core fields in the occurrence editor. And they might not be necessarily the ones that you would have immediately thought about, but they are important fields and I'll show them to you down here. They are mostly under locality. If you click this little up carrot, you'll see that we now have continent, water body, island group, and island. And those are all Darwin Core fields. And I believe they all export in a Darwin Core archive as well. Another change is that um, we have begin start date and end date. And when those get pushed into a Darwin Core archive, that's going to be a date range. So if you have a date range on your specimen, for example, it says like August to, or July to August 1991, then you could actually put separate start and end dates, which is nice. Um, you'll also see that one thing has been removed from the occurrence editor and maybe you have never noticed it before, so it might not even affect you. But um, there used to be a little carrot here where you could look at the um, year, month, and day values. And that's no longer here because those can be extracted from the date, either via search or via um, download. So uh, that's no longer enabled here. And we're still working with how that's going to be, uh, we're still figuring out how that's going to be handled in um, all of the tools 
related to the portals. So let us know if you run into any issues with that. Um, let me see if I missed anything. Nope, that already existed. Can move on from there. Okay, um, thanks to another Digitization Thematic Collections Network, the Global TCN, which was a, a bryophyte and lichen digitization project. We've been able to do a lot of improvement to our mapping features. So one big thing is that we've moved away from Google Maps because Google Maps required you to basically pay for an API key. And if a lot of people uh, did a query in the, in the portal, we would end up getting a bill. Not that bad in smaller portals, but once you get really big portals, you might have a few hundred dollars that you owe every month. And that was not super sustainable when there are some open source options out there. So we're using leaflet maps, which use OpenStreetMap. They look very similar. And I will show you some proof. So here I'm opening up our leaflet map looks very similar. You still have your very basic, you have your topo available. There you go, there's topo. It's got the lines and everything. Um, you can also do satellite, just like you could in Google. Um, or you can just do, you know, your terrain with your streets. One big improvement that I've seen is now when you just click on a record, it opens up the window. Instead of you having to click on the uh, window associated with the button, it's, it's actually just the, the button itself. And then if there are multiple records at the same location, you should see some record spidering, which I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find that, but. If there are multiple records on the exact same place and you click it, you'll get this little spider effect where there's a bunch of points radiating out from a central um, hub, and then you'll be able to click on which one you want to actually look at. Um, I see some questions in the chat, so I'll comment on those real quick. Mike says, one minor issue with leaflet maps is that the labels of localities seem to remain small. Yes, Mike, I have also experienced that. And it's very frustrating that when you zoom in, like the font still stays really small. So we do have that on our docket to investigate how we can fix that. Um, Allison says, will continent be auto added to our collections? Is there a geographical thesaurus for island and island group? I've tried figuring out islands and it's bewildering. Um, continent as of now will not be auto, auto added to your collections, but I imagine that that will happen in a future release. Um, and then there is not currently a geographic thesaurus for island or island group. But one of the things that we're not actually going to discuss here, because it's not super apparent to the public, is that there will there is um, a geographic thesaurus now. And that geographic thesaurus um, can be populated via an automated um, um, API call to another source. I don't know if that other source has island data, however. So could be something that uh, we work on together to populate once the geographic thesaurus is a little bit um, easier to interact with. Um, let me go back to my map. Oh, one thing I was super excited to show you that I neglected too is if we go back to our open search panel here, you have a new option. If you go into map options, you can turn on or off clustering. Um, if you want to turn on clustering, like if you have a huge query, you could be like, I just want to know the gist of where everything is. Otherwise, all the points will be on like that. Um, but then you can also use create a heat map. 
So if I turn on heat map, you can adjust all your um, parameters however you want. Let's change that to five. And you can make heat maps of your favorite tax set. Granted, the maps are only going to be as good as the underlying data. So if this is, if I thought this is the only place that Helianthus annuus existed in the entire United States, I would be sadly mistaken, but that's because this is a California-centric portal. Mary asks, what is the source of the geographic thesaurus? Uh, there is no geographic thesaurus yet, Mary. Um, the 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 um, tables are there, but it has not been populated for all the portals um, by default. That is a process that we can start doing though. And that is, um, and if we do that, the API that we have a connection to is, uh, I forget what it's called, um, but I can point you to the documentation. Brad, you have a question. Yeah, hi. Is the for the heat map? Is that only for records with lat long? Yes, the maps are always only for records with lat long. Okay, so you couldn't do like a county level heat map. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on mapping? New tools. All right, I'll keep moving along. All right. Um, <clears throat> next, thanks to a funding of a project with the California Botanic Garden, George Mason University and Botanical Research Institute of Texas at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden, um, we now have a new and improved link resources tab, as well as an, a way to bulk import extended data or linked resources um, to that tab. And as we mentioned at the very beginning, this is going to be the focus of next month's Symbiota support group because using this extended data import tool is a little bit um, in depth. So we're gonna be covering that more next month, but I'll just kind of give you a brief overview of what this means. So if I go into uh, my collection and I open up a random record, one of the tabs here at the top is called linked resources. And linked resources can be of many different types. If I click this little plus sign, it's going to show me kind of some very basic information. And those types can be a non-occurrence resource link. That means a link to something that isn't itself like a specimen or a um, observation. Occurrence in kind of biodiversity standards lingo just means a, um, instance of a taxon at a place at a time. And so if you're not linking a specific instance of a taxon at a place at a time, we would call that a non-occurrence resource link. And that would just be a link to maybe the field notes or um, something else that's related to that one particular specimen, but is not itself a specimen. And so you can say, okay, here's my link and here are the current relationships that are in this database. These relationships can be altered per portal, depending on what types of relationships you might wanna be linking into your portal. Um, and then you can put that, uh, the link to that resource here. Then there are other types you can link to an occurrence. So let's say that you have a specimen that is uh, was collected at the exact same time and place, but isn't the same species as the original or as your other specimen, you could link those two together and say, maybe they're ecologically occurs with or something like that. 
You could add an occurrence link. So again, a specimen or observation link to a portal that's somewhere else. So that could be, um, it could be you have a specimen that was collected and then you collected like a beetle off of that specimen, but you store that beetle data in ecdysis, but you store your plant data in some other portal. You could say, hey, I'm gonna link this beetle. This beetle occurred on this plant and that relationship could be host of or has host, uh, depending on which direction you're going in. So again, I'll go into more detail about all of this next month, but um, it's just a little bit more um, streamlined that you can now choose what type of association you're going to um, make, and then it will change which fields it provides to you based on that uh, type of association. And this is still in pretty active development, so we're looking forward to having more people working in it and um, debugging it. And then if I go back to my collection management here and go to import update specimen records, there is an option here called extended data import. And I'm gonna choose associations. And then you can upload a spreadsheet or a CSV of the associations to your occurrences. And again, we'll go into that next month. But that means that if you have a bunch of links to field notes to different specimens, or you have a bunch of host um, parasite interactions or whatever you have, then you can batch upload those via a file instead of having to do things one by one. Okay, any questions about those particular changes or tools? Geo boundaries. Thanks, Ed. So Ed put a link to the um, geographic thesaurus populating tool that the API can access or that can be accessed to populate a geographic thesaurus. But we won't be going into depth about the geographic thesaurus today. We can answer questions for sure, but that's probably worth exploring in another webinar because it is also um, can be in depth. Where are the non-occurrence resource links stored in the database? Uh, Katie, there's a table called OM Occur Associations, and that's where all linked resources are currently stored. And it doesn't store, oh, um, non-occurrence, yeah, those are just all in OM Occur Associations. Okay, moving right along. Another new feature in Symbiota 3.1 is an image batch tagging tool. So singular images can be tagged and you might have noticed this. If I go into my images tab and I look at one of my single images, you can tag them depending on what tags have been included in your portal. For example, the bryophyte and the lichen portals just had some new tags added to um, show things like this is a microscope slide, or this is an up close microscope image. Um, but I'm pretty sure these are all the defaults. So you used to be able to do these singularly, and as you can see, you still can. But if you go into the image search and you do a custom image search, let's say I only want specimen images from my collection of let's do California poppy, everyone's favorite in this portal. And if you have editing access to the images that you're looking at, you can click this little pencil icon 
and you will have the ability to batch tag these images according to whatever tag you want. So in this case, I would say, well, there is there is an organism in this one and this one and this one, or you could probably just say there's an organism in all of these, but I would want to check them all. And if I clicked batch assign tag, then it would assign that particular tag to all of the specimen records. And it would tell me if any of them already had that tag, then it would say, I didn't add another one of those because it's already tagged that way. So this has been um, particularly useful for the Big B Thematic Collections Network who funded this work because they are taking multiple, um, multiple orientation photos to their bees. So they have like a dorsal view, they have a frontal view, they have a side view, um, they have like a left or right. And so they're able to batch tag depending on whether they're all like a front view or a side view. And that way, if someone wants to search for only front views or only side views, they can do that using the image search very efficiently using the tags. And they have some workflows that enable them to um, apply those tags as the images are added as well, based on the file names. Probably also something we should talk about in a future Symbiota support group. But if you already have a bunch of images up there, you can batch tag them. Okay. Any question about that? Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Hey, sorry. Um, is it possible to batch a copyright addition to images yet or not? Not me at the front end, but if you have like a list of specimen or less of images that you want to do that to, you could just send it to us and we could apply that on the back end. Okay. I, I think I've mentioned this once before. It's if you want to add a copyright right now, you click on the arrow, you get a pick list of every single person's last name in the whole database. Mm -hmm. And you have to scroll down and find your name and pick it. And you have to do that for each image you add, I believe. So mm -hmm. it's kind of in, in, inefficient the way it is right now. Yeah. And depending on how you upload your images, if um, you're just doing kind of the normal, we upload to Globus, I don't think that will change soon. Um, if you are uploading your own image links, then there will be an, an ability to add the photographer. UID as you're doing a, a linking upload. Um, but yeah, I would just say send us a list of all the images you want and we can batch change them to the photographer names that you want. Okay, thanks. Frank, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment. So generally we're trying to share um, images under um, Creative Commons licenses. So um, unless you really have a good reason why you want to maintain the, the copyright, maybe that's a professional photographer, for example, who wants to maintain the, the copyright. Um, there's a difference between what's um, the copyright holder and what's uh, the person who took the photo. So I just wanted to point it out. So when you upload images to the portal um, and you add yourself as the author of that photo or the creator of that photo, um, then you can still share, or presumably, if you not specifically say that you um, want to maintain the copyright, then uh, you share it under the Creative Commons license as um, specified in the policies of the portal. Gotcha. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, I, I actually was just talking about adding the photographer, right? I, I, I want all my images to be uh, freely available, right? Yeah, and I think that's great. It would be cool if, especially if you have some field photos that you want to add, like, by all means, get your credit. Okay, um, we have recently been working pretty closely with the United States Department of Agriculture, um, particularly the National Arboretum, which has been a really exciting collaboration. And um, working with them has enabled us to do a ton of development toward um, increasing our site accessibility. So if you've ever heard of section 508, 508 is a particular, I think 
um, law or mandate of trying to increase the accessibility of sites, especially to things like screen readers so that people who are visually impaired can use the sites more easily. And we've been able to uh, have leaps and bounds of improvement in that realm. So, and they also have developed a few other things that are kind of still in the pipeline. But one of them that you might see most immediately is a collection quick search has been improved. Go back to my collection. Then there's this quick search right here. And uh, you used to be able to search by your catalog number, but now you can search by catalog number and taxon. And if you click edit, then it goes straight to the editing instead of going to the table, which you then have to click to get to your editing form. So just a little bit quicker. But the biggest thing that the USDA has been able to help us out with is um, funding the development of accessibility. So it might not look super different for you, um, or you might not be able to access it visually, but that's because a lot of the improvements are kind of under the hood improvements to help the accessibility of the site. Okay, and then um, I could go on and on and on about the millions of small changes that have been made. And if you are really interested, then you could go into our GitHub repository and kind of track all of the, um, uh, the PRs as we call them, um, that's trying to get new versions of the, of the data and new tools involved, bug fixes, et cetera. Um, but that would just take a lot of time and you, not all of them are super, super significant. So I, those are the highlights. So now I'll briefly talk about how to get more information about all of these and how to provide feedback. Hopefully you all are more than familiar with our GitHub repos, or sorry, our um, Symbiota Docs. Symbiota Docs is our documentation site and all of these tools now have documentation in Symbiota Docs. So for example, if I look up tagging, there's tagging individual images. Here's the protocol or at least the how-to for batch tagging. And similar documentation occur it exists for all of the others as well. So if I go into my collection manager guide, this is where you're going to find information about batch loading um, associations. So you could read this in preparation for next month's Symbiota support group, and you can bring, bring your questions there. This just gives some really useful documentation about the new tool and how it can be used. So as always, uh, we want to hear your feedback. We want to see uh, hear about your sticking points or things that just don't seem to be working well as the Symbiota code gets rolled out to all the portals eventually. So please feel free to email us at help at symbiota.org. Um, and then you can report any issues as well to our GitHub repository. Either way works for us. We just wanna make things as easy as possible for you to get the feedback to us about what needs to be changed or improved. And it's possible that if uh, something that you add gets moved to one of our other repositories, that means that it's just, um, like things that are bugs, we move to one repository and things that are more like wishlist items we store in a different repository. So you might see things get moved. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It just means that we're using it to keep track of um, our priorities and the issues that come up. And Lindsay just put a um, link in the chat to a new article on our symbiota.org website that lists out a lot of these new um, functionalities that we talked about today and then links to the documentation for each of the new tools. So that will be super helpful. And we'll be sending emails to you with those links as well. For example, the Bryophyte portal got their email this morning saying that the um, Symbiota 3.1 is coming to their portal very soon. So you'll get one of those per portal pretty much. 
and then we will notify you as soon as the um, the code has actually been released to your portal. That does mean that you need to be uh, subscribed to hub at symbiota.org if you are an administrator to a collection in a Symbiota portal or if you have subscribed um, via our online link, then you should get those emails, but just make sure to check your spam because sometimes those get blocked by spam filters. And if you're not getting anything from hub at symbiota.org or help at symbiota.org, then just reach out to us and we can try to help you um, troubleshoot that. Frank, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I, I was ask, gonna ask, um, so um, looking at this image tag tagging in batch, which I think is great, um, if I do a query search for something, say without any tags, which most of the uh, things in ASU are still uh, not tagged, um, and then I can quickly select like via box everything, but sometimes that means there's several pages. If I uh, use that box, will that apply to all pages? Um, uh, so does that mean I only the tags that I, uh, only the images that I see Get tagged with that tag that I assign um, in them too, or is it is it going to apply it to everything across several pages? I don't remember actually. I think it only does one page, and you can change the number of results on the page. Yeah. But I believe it only does to all the pages or all the um, images that you're seeing on that one page. Okay, because uh, say for example, I'm going through there and tag all the things that have specimens first. And then those disappear, I noticed, because the, uh, the thing refreshes once the tag um, is um, applied to the image. Then uh, typically in the next search page, I, I see mostly labels. So I could say, OK, I click everything. But if I click everything, and that applies then to everything that ret uh, is returned by the search, then zoomly on the next page or so, it would also be specimens, so and they would then be mistagged if I did that. Um, so it kind of is important that I would that it would only apply to the images that I currently see on the screen, so to speak. Yeah, I would have to double check, but I think it only does it on the page that you're looking okay. at. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's correct. It only does on the on what you see on the page. Great. Thanks, Ed. Other questions or comments? I mean, the big question have... is always, when when is it coming to my portal? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was just going to ask. This is Allison, because I was just going in like, ooh, I can put my Africa things in. But I don't see the country portal yet for CCH2. So is there a schedule? It's in CCH2. Hmm. OK. Then I just have to look a little harder. Thanks. Yeah, it's on a little up carrot. You have to click the up carrot button, and then the things will show up above the um, above your country levels. Perfect. Thanks. No problem. Other questions. All right, well, I guess if there are no questions, we can close it up for the day. Um, like I said, we'll be sending emails to you once uh, we have a schedule of which portals are coming next. I think the next one in the queue is the Bryophyte portal and the Guatemala portal is also on its way. The Cynet portals will likely be pretty far last because those impact the largest amount of people. So we wanna make sure that we're kind of rolling this out, fixing all the bugs before it affects 10,000 people at one time. Um, but so you'll you'll see those eventually. Frank, you have another? Yeah, I just wanted to comment that I really um, think this new rollout is great. I've explored many of the functionality and I just uh, wanted to say big thanks and congratulations to the team. Um, 
I know I've been bitching about things that don't work, but they almost all got fixed, and that that's really great. And I um, look forward to using and exploring this stuff more. So, thanks, Frank. You've been an excellent power user. Um, one additional thing, I guess, is that some of the portals, because the styling has is a little bit changed, you might see some cosmetic differences between the old and the new version. We're trying to minimize them, make them look pretty much the same as they previously did. But for example, in the lichen portal, we no longer have those three lichen images. We have one lichen image on the background of the banner. Um, so there might be similar things like that that are um, relatively minor, but just hopefully changes for the better streamlining things. So, And if you're like, that's the ugliest picture of a flower I've ever seen, please remove it from my portal. Sure, we'll, we'll listen to that too. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone. Keep writing us into your future grants so that you can get your favorite things funded and they can show up in future code releases. Um, if you want any uh, consultation about that, feel free to chat with us. But otherwise, we're just gonna keep moving forward with the funds that we have. And we're really grateful for all of your guys' support and for your feedback. And we look forward to seeing you around and hopefully seeing you in September. Bye, everyone.